Today on The Nation Speaks, we go deep looking at current COVID policies and what lies behind them. Are they based on the latest science and are they based on the right assumptions? We explore it all for an entire episode with Dr. Paul Alexander, a former White House COVID policy advisor and an expert in epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. And in America Q&A, we ask what people across the country think of strict pandemic measures like locking down the unvaccinated in Germany and quarantine camps in Australia. And what do people know about the risk of COVID for kids? That's what we ask in our second America Q&A. Hello and welcome to The Nation Speaks. I'm your host, Cindy Drucker. We've got a big topic today. What is the state of the science behind our current COVID policies? I think it's probably safe to say that very few of us have a deep understanding of the biology of viruses, how they infect cells, replicate, do battle with our immune systems, or spread through a population. Most of us don't think about such things very much at all. That is, until there's a pandemic, and suddenly these exact questions impact how we live our daily life. So we trust the experts, and we hope that our decision makers are consulting with the best of them when creating policy. Therefore, if we look at the policy, we should be able to deduce what's currently known about the virus. Well, right now, in the United States and in many other countries, the idea driving most policy decisions is that to beat this pandemic, we need to vaccinate 100% of the population, including children. And that's based on a series of assumptions which we will explore. Some of those assumptions are these. One, vaccines stop people from getting or transmitting COVID. Two, everyone in society is at the same risk from COVID, including children. So we should have the same policies for everyone. Three, unvaccinated people are a danger to others, including the vaccinated. So we need to isolate people who are not vaccinated using vaccine mandates and passports. Assumption four, vaccinated people pose no danger to each other or to anyone else. Five. Vaccine protection wanes over time, so boosters will likely keep being necessary perhaps every six months. And this is safe even for children. Six, vaccines are better than natural immunity, so even those who have recovered from COVID should get vaccinated. Seven, therapeutics can't help. We have to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. Lastly, eight, everything just said above is informed by relevant studies and cost-benefit analyses. To help us dig into these assumptions, particularly as they relate to children, which is the big push right now, we're joined by the Brownstone Institute's Dr. Paul Alexander. He's an expert in evidence-based medicine, research methodology, and clinical epidemiology, which is why he was recruited from Canada to advise the Trump administration on COVID policy. Paul, I know you are very busy, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, and it's a pleasure privilege to be here. Thank you. I'd like you to help us unpack some of these assumptions, but before we dive into it, could you very briefly explain to us what evidence-based medicine is and why that gives you expertise and insight that others might not have? Evidence-based medicine approach is one where decision-making has to be based, we are seeing, on the body of evidence. So we want that approach to be very systematic and laid out so that other scientists reading your work could reproduce your methodology uh, to see how you arrived at that finding and to see if your research included the entire, the full body of evidence. And you, you, you didn't happen to miss important pieces of, the, of evidence so that we could be confident that this decision making right now is based on the full, most updated, trustworthy evidence so that we can remove the researcher bias from the table. So for our current COVID policies, I think most people assume, um, as I mentioned, that decisions are being made on all of the best possible evidence that everything has been looked at. Is that <laughs> the case? When they implemented lockdowns, as an example, and they implemented school closures. We knew quickly, maybe one month after the beginning of the lockdowns in March of 2020, we knew after three weeks to one month that those lockdowns were not working in terms of COVID transmission or the school closures had no role. 
In fact, we knew the science was accumulating, the evidence was accumulating across the world that the lockdowns and the school closures and the mass mandates were not even having an effect. In fact, mass mandates is an example. Everywhere that they implemented a mass mandate in the United States, every country, every state in America, cases, infections actually went up. Wherever they implemented lockdowns, infections went up. And we had the graphs, so we had the evidence. So these people who were sitting down in these task forces making decisions, they were not consulting the evidence. Because had they been consulting the evidence, they would have known they should stop what they were doing. When you implement a policy, you have to revisit your policy and re-evaluate re it constantly, particularly against the alternatives, so that if the policy is catastrophic or devastating, you can revisit it and stop it and pivot to an alternative policy. Particularly, you would want to implement policies only after you do a cost-effectiveness cost analysis where you consider the costs and the benefits for a series of policy alternatives, not just one. At no point in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, has anyone in any task force, in any government, conducted a cost-effectiveness cost analysis? And that's what we saw glaring in the beginning. And we said, well, how could you be making these high policy decisions, sweeping decisions, and you are not examining them, examining them the way they should be examined? Okay, so let's go through some of the assumptions. Right now, the big policy push is for 100% vaccination of everybody, children included. <clears throat> the promise at the beginning was that these vaccines would be, I think they're called sterilizing vaccines, right? They're perfect vaccines. There would be no transmission. You won't get illness. We know from breakthrough cases that's not the case, but that policy hasn't changed. So how do you explain that? Well, partly I would say they don't know what they're doing, number one. No, and I'm, and I'm not making, not, I'm, I'm, I'm being very sincere here. We have a recent paper published in the Brownstone Institute. We have 33 separate studies that have accumulated in the last six months to show that the vaccine does not recognize the Delta variant. They have not come out outright and said the vaccine has failed, but I'm seeing it. We all understand that it's failed. For you to be getting third booster in eight months, and in Israel and the United Kingdom now, they've gone to a fourth booster. And now people are talking about a fifth. Those people who have taken the vaccine are going to have to take a booster every four to five months. Now, Dr. Fauci said that the definition of fully vaccinated is going to be changed. So you will not be able to exercise your societal privileges. This is a very, very serious place we are societally and in the world. You have no more decision-making on these vaccines anymore. They are changing the goalpost 